Galatians chapter 2. We're going to just read the first five verses. Um, uh, Good preaching etiquette dictates that I'm not supposed to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, I haven't had much, I didn't have as much time to study and sermon prep this week as I normally do. I've been busy at the funeral home. Um, So this sermon isn't going to be, this message isn't going to be as well organized as uh, I'm, I'm used to, uh, as I'm used to having on, in my notes. Uh, so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to do something a little different. We're going to go through the text, and I'm just going to explain what the text is saying as we go along, because the because the the purpose of going through the book of Galatians or any book of the Bible is to give you the general idea of what God is saying in the text, and and hopefully. In, when we get to the end of it, you're going to understand the book of Galatians fairly well. When we get to the end of this thing, you're going to... That's my goal anytime I go through a book of the Bible in the pulpit, is that by the end of it, we will be able to understand what it's saying, what God is saying in the, te- in the context of redemptive history, and why this book is necessary in our canon. So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 1 through 5. And if you have that text, you may stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Hear the word of the Lord. Paul, or I'm sorry, I was reading chapter 1. Um, chapter 2. <laughs> You're all right. There we go. Chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who are of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage." to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. This ends the reading of God's word, the word of God for the people of God. May be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, this is your word. We are your people. And we come hungry and thirsty for the goodness and the riches of your word this morning. And I ask, Lord, that you would anoint these stammering lips to bring forth the glories of your praise in this text. We ask, Lord, that you would open up this text to us by the power of your Spirit so that we would hear it, receive it with joy, and see the, good, see the goodness of the gospel therein. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So this is a continuation of the autobiographical section of Galatians. I mentioned last week that the, the autobiographical section of Galatians uh, begins in Galatians 1.11, and it continues on through the entirety of chapter 2. And this is where Paul is laying out his credentials. This is where Paul is, is giving us his resume, so to speak, because there are many people in, in the churches of Galatia who are fighting against the gospel. They are fighting against Paul. They're saying things like, well, you know, Paul is just a human just like the rest of us. He doesn't have any more authority than we do. And so what he's, saying is, what he's saying is wrong and what we're saying is right. And what Paul is doing is he is saying, look, I have been called by Christ to deliver this gospel. I received this gospel directly from him. And so I know that what I'm saying is true. And, and in the last chapter, toward, in the end of chapter 1, we read where Paul actually went to Arabia, where Mount Sinai is, and he received the gospel directly from the Lord there, uh, in Arabia. And then in here in chapter 2, he's saying not only did he receive the gospel directly from the Lord, he actually went and communicated that gospel that he received to the, to the apostles who were in Jerusalem to confirm that what he was saying and what he had heard and what he was preaching was the truth. So notice what he, he says here. He says in verse 1, he says, I went up again to Jerusalem. This, this is 14 years after Um, this incident, 14 years after he was in Arabia, he says, I went to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. So this is a reference to Paul going up to the Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15. So if it's helpful for you to do this, then I recommend 
that if you write anywhere in the margin of your Bible that you would mark Acts 15, 6 through 33 next to Galatians 2, 1 because that will help you understand that the, the Jerusalem trip that he's referring to here is Acts chapter 15. This is the Jerusalem council. And so Acts chapter 15 verses uh, 6 through 33 is a rather, rather large portion of scripture that summarizes the events of the Jerusalem council. So I don't want to read that whole portion, but I do want to bring, your, bring to your attention the, the heart of the matter because this council was what was going to affirm that righteousness could be found outside of circumcision. It was going to affirm that, that righteousness and the truth of the gospel could be found outside of, of circumcision. And, and this is what Paul will say later in Romans when he says that righteousness is found outside of the law. So in Acts chapter 15, if you'll notice in Acts chapter 15, verses 22 through 29, it says, Then it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They wrote this letter by them, the apostles and the elders and the brethren, to the brethren who are the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. Greetings. And since we have heard, some, since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. And so if you look, if you look back at uh, verse 1 in this same chapter, you'll notice that what this entire issue is all about. It, the issue is that people are coming along and they're saying, well, you have to be circumcised. And, and, the, and it's Judaizers, by the way, who are doing this. It's, it was the Jews who were coming in and they were saying, look, you've got to be circumcised in order to be saved. You've got to be circumcised in order to be a believer because that's what happened with Jews. They were circumcised first and then they became believers. And so what they were essentially saying is you've got to take on a Jewish identity first before you can take on a Christian identity. And, and this was upsetting Gentiles. This was upsetting the Gentile believers because they had come into the church, they had received salvation, they had received the Holy Spirit, and now the Judaizers were coming along saying, no, that's not good enough, you have to be circumcised like we are. And of course, if you were here a few weeks ago when we, talk about, uh, when we talked about why that was, the Judaizers were basically making the argument that it would help them fit in with, better with society. It would carve out a place for them in the world, and it, would, and it would add to their salvation, essentially. And Paul is saying, no, that's not how this works. And so as you read, the, as you read what happened in the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, what happens is the argument gets made by Paul and Barnabas. They're... And, and even Peter, Peter, this is important later because Peter is going to, to kind of flip-flop back and forth on this issue. But Paul, Barnabas, and Peter all make the argument in Acts chapter 15 that the Gentiles have received the Holy Spirit just as the Jewish believers have. They've, they've seen evidence that the Gentiles have received the Holy Spirit and so they don't need to be circumcised. There's no reason for them to be circumcised. Because if you look back, in Acts chapter 15 again, it said uh, in verse 7, And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear and hear the word of the gospel and believe. So our Sunday school lesson this morning was about Acts chapter 10. Peter going into the house of Cornelius and preaching the gospel to Cornelius and his family and those who were there. And Cornelius and his family received the gospel. They believed. And so this is that event 
that Peter is refer- this is that event that Peter is referring to. He says, God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And so... He goes on to build this argument that God is working signs, wonders, and miracles among the Gentiles. The Gentiles are receiving the Holy Spirit. There's absolutely no need for them to be circumcised. And this, is, this council meeting in Jerusalem is what Paul is using as a basis for what he is saying in the book of Galatians. Okay? So that, now that that's clear as mud, right? <laughs> now that that's clear as mud, we, we can continue with what Paul is saying in Galatians chapter 2. So notice what he says here in verse 2. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately, that's, that's important, but privately to those who were of reputation. He's referring to the apostles who were in Jerusalem. Lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. So when Paul gets to Jerusalem before he has this uh, big public meeting, before he has the big council meeting that we just read about, he has a private meeting with the apostles at Jerusalem where he communicates to them the gospel that he had been preaching. And what's interesting about this statement that he makes at the end of verse 2 is he said that he did this in case he might be running or had run in vain. Notice what he says there about running in vain. So he met with the apostles in Jerusalem privately before the big council meeting to be sure that he and they were both preaching the same gospel. He did this to be sure that he hadn't been preaching something that was wrong or inaccurate. Another interesting thing about that phrase is that later in Galatians chapter 5 verse 7, he makes another reference to running a race. He says, if you, he says, you know, if you look at Galatians 5, 7, you'll notice he says, you ran well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? So throughout Galatians, Paul uses this imagery of running to give us the idea of someone who is actively moving in a way that is congruent with the good news of Jesus. This is why we read, this is why we read where Paul uses the same kind of imagery in his final letter to Timothy when he says this about himself in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. He says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. As you study the New Testament as a whole, one of the things you'll notice is that, in the Christ, is that the Christian life is one of constant motion. The Christian life is one of constant motion. For example, notice what Paul says to Timothy just two chapters earlier in 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 7. He says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a good soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must first partake, the hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. So there's three pictures in that passage that Paul uses to communicate one simple message. He uses the picture of a soldier... He uses the picture of an athlete and he uses the picture of a hard-working farmer to communicate the idea that the Christian life is one of constant motion. Soldiers, athletes, and hard-working farmers all have one thing in common, and it's that they don't get their job done by sitting around and waiting for something to happen. So what Paul says in Galatians 2.2 is that he wants to be sure that he's, he's running this race correctly. He wants to be sure that he's preaching correctly. He wants to make sure he's preaching correctly because if he's not, then all of this work that he's been doing is just a race that's been run in vain. 
And so he meets with the apostles at Jerusalem to confirm that he's preaching the same message and they're preaching the same message before they go into this council meeting and, and have this showdown with the Judaizers. Now notice what Paul says in verses 3 through 5. This is where the conflict comes to a head. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So before we get too deep into the conflict itself, I want you to notice that Paul had two primary figures that we would come to think of as his sons in the faith. Who are they? Titus and Timothy. And I find it rather interesting that if you read Acts chapter 16, right after the council of Jerusalem, in verses 1 through 3, after the Jerusalem council, Timothy was circumcised so that he could minister more effectively to the Jews, but Titus wasn't. So I want you to think about that. After this council, where they had determined that righteousness could and salvation could exist outside of circumcision. They had made this decision at the council. They had determined that that was the truth of the matter. Why was it that after they had determined that circumcision wasn't necessary, that, that Timothy was circumcised after that? Have you ever thought about that? Why is it that Timothy was circumcised right after they made that decision? Well... If you notice, it says that Titus here, he's a Greek, he's not circumcised. And Timothy and Titus were both, were both disciples, if you want to call them that, of Paul. Well, the difference is that there's two different situations at work. If you, there's two different situations at work. And the situation with Timothy is that if you read about Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, you will notice that Timothy was raised as a Jew. He was never circumcised, but he was raised as a Jew uh, because his mother was Jewish and his grandmother was Jewish. His father was a Gentile. So Paul wanted Timothy to be circumcised because it would have allowed him to relate more to his primarily Jewish audience. It wasn't a matter of salvation because Timothy was already saved. And people in that community where Timothy was in Acts chapter 16, recognized that he was saved. So his circumcision had nothing to do with his salvation and whether or not he had salvation. It had to do with him being able to relate to his Jewish audience that he was going to be preaching to. If you've had the same experiences to someone, as someone else, you can relate to them better. And so Timothy was raised as a Jew, and he worshipped like a Jew, but he was never circumcised. Titus, on the other hand, was completely Gentile. He had no Jewish connections whatsoever in his family. And so there was not, and so there was, and he was not going to be ministering to Jews either. Because if you read in, in Titus chapter 1, Paul sends Titus to Crete, which is a Gentile area, so that he can establish elders and plant churches there in Crete. So Titus isn't going to be ministering to, to Jews like Timothy is. So Paul wanted Timothy to be circumcised because it would have allowed him to relate more to his, prim to his primarily Jewish audience. And at, and at that point, it wasn't an issue of being a member of the covenant. He's part Jewish. He's already well ingrained in Jewish culture. He might as well be circumcised so that he can relate to the Jews to whom he will be preaching the gospel. Titus, however, doesn't need to be circumcised because he's all Gentile. Both of his parents are Gentiles, and his calling is not going to be to minister to the Jews. We know that because if you read Titus 1... Paul talks, talks about him going to Crete. So for the Apostle Paul, the issue of circumcision isn't one of should you do it or should you not do it. The question has more to do with motivation. And Paul's answer to the question is that if you think circumcision is going to create salvation or enhance the salvation you already have, then no, don't do it. And that's, that principle applies to everything in life. If, if you think for one second that you can add to or take away from your salvation with your works, with anything that you do, don't do it because that's going to disrupt the idea that you are saved by faith through grace. There's no way that you can add to the, to the finished work of Christ on your behalf. 
There's no way that you can add to the finished work of Christ on your behalf. He has done everything for you. That's why Peter says that we have been given all things that, that pertain to life in godliness. Well, how many things is all things? It's all. And so Martin Luther, in his commentary on Galatians, he says this. He says, Paul didn't reject circumcision as a practice to be condemned, and neither by word nor by deed did he require the Jews to abandon it. In chapter 7 of his first letter to the Corinthians, he said, was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised, you know, as if he could. However, he rejected circumcision as something necessary for righteousness. That's key. Paul rejected circumcision as something that was necessary for righteousness. He showed that the fathers were not justified because of their circumcision in Romans chapter 4 verse 11, for it was only a sign, a seal of righteousness by which they testified that they had expressed their faith. So, here's the question. How are we saved? Well, the, tip, the, you know, the New Testament answer to that question is that we are saved by faith alone. But you know what else is true? People have always been saved by faith alone. People have always been saved by faith alone. People think that in the Old Covenant, the people of God were saved by the sacrifices and the ceremonies, but that's not true. The sacrifices and the ceremonies weren't going to save anybody who didn't have faith in their efficacy. I mean, can you imagine if, can you imagine if someone went to offer a spotless lamb as a sacrifice and they didn't believe that the spotless lamb would atone for their sins? If they didn't believe that, it wasn't going to. There, there always has, there's always, there's, there always has been faith involved in worship. There's always been faith involved in offering a sacrifice, in performing a ritual, in doing the ceremony. And it's that faith that saves, not the thing itself. The sacrifices and ceremonies were the appropriate expressions of faith for that administration of the covenant. And so if that's the case then, then the logical question is now, well, what are the expressions of faith for this administration of the covenant that we live under? What do we have that now serves as our expressions of faith? The Lord's Supper and Baptism. Paul says in Galatians 2 that they didn't compromise on this issue of the gospel. Titus didn't need to be circumcised and neither did the rest of the Gentiles who were new believers in the church because now the circumcision that matters most is not a circumcision of the flesh, it is a circumcision of the heart. That's why Paul writes in Romans chapter 2 verses 28 and 29, he says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So notice again what Paul says in verse 4, that all of this occurred, in, going back to Galatians chapter 2, verse 4, notice what Paul says. He says, this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by, spell, by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. I want you to pay attention to the strong language that Paul uses to describe the Judaizers in verse 4. He calls them false brethren. He calls them false brethren. David Guzik notes that they did not come in with, with name badges that said false brother. They didn't come in with a purpose statement that said we've come to spy out your liberty and bring you into bondage. These men probably had the best of intentions, but they were still dangerous men who had to be confronted. We need to understand that there are still dangerous people today who attack the body of Christ and they need to be confronted. Now I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but what we're going to see next week as we, as we finish this chapter is that Peter almost became one of these people un until Paul withstood him to the face and corrected him. And what we see is that, what we see is that today like I said, there are false brethren within the church today. And Paul even warned us that this would happen if we take his warning on a practical level to the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. Paul's getting ready to leave Ephesus and he gives them his final farewell sermon. And he says that there's going to come wolves 
from within you. He doesn't say that there's going to come wolves from outside the church. He said there's going to, there's going to come wolves who rise up from within the church to attack you. And that's, you know, we, you know generally whenever you have a small group of people like this, um, I mean, it, it, nature just kind of dictates that we become naturally skeptical of anybody who just walks in. But the danger of any church, the danger of any church is that there's always a possibility of false brethren coming from within to damage the, to damage the theological infrastructure of the church, to damage the gospel that's being preached. And so whenever you have a pastor, for example... In any congregation, if they get up and they preach this, they preach this book. If they're doing their best to preach the Bible, if they're doing their best to make sure that the gospel goes forth every week, there's a strong possibility that someone's going to get mad over. And it, it's just what it is. And that anger can result in division. It can result in disruption. And so there, there's always a possibility of that occurring. And so Paul says that these false brethren were brought in to spy out this liberty that they have in Christ, this liberty to live after Christ without the law, without the ceremonial law, that is. And finally, notice at the end of verse 5 that Paul says that they didn't give in. Paul says they didn't give in so that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Paul gave everything for the sake of unity in the church because he loved the church. And he was thankful for the church. Most of his greetings in other letters include some kind of prayer or expression of thankfulness for the church. Paul loved the church. And everything Paul did was so that the gospel would continue with them in the church. Most pastors I know of don't enjoy conflict. We just, we just don't. We like to keep things peaceful if we can. I know I don't enjoy conflict, but if we have to engage in conflict so that unity in the church isn't disrupted, we will. John Calvin said that God gave pastors two voices, one to comfort the sheep and one to fend off the wolves. And wisdom is knowing which voice to use at the appropriate time. And so that is the conflict in Jerusalem. That is the conflict that Paul was dealing with when he went to this trip, went on this trip to Jerusalem 14 years after he received the gospel in Arabia. He goes up. I would really recommend, I'm not going to give you homework. I, I hate homework, and I'm not going to give it to other people. But if you want to do some homework, I highly recommend you read Acts, the entirety of Acts chapter 15 this week and see what Paul was dealing with there in Jerusalem and see how that council, you see how that first council meeting defined how the church would act and respond to this issue of circumcision. Because what, what happens in that council meeting in Jerusalem is going to be the basis, like I said earlier, it's going to be the basis for everything Paul says in the book of Galatians. So, matter of fact, I would even go as far as saying that the book of Galatians is Paul's commentary on that council meeting. Well, I think I'm done this morning. I'm going to pray for us and then Brittany's going to sing a closing song. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, this is your word and we are your people. And I ask, Lord, that you would let this word settle into our hearts and souls. And I ask, Lord, that you'd give us the, the strength to, uh, to go another week. And that, Lord, as we leave this place, we would leave here knowing that you're good, you're faithful, and this word that we preach is true in every sense of the word. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen.